Hey, how's it going guys? Martin here. It's been a while. I took on so much the last couple of years, probably more than I should have. And um, so videos have been sporadic, but uh, uh, oh, we moved. That was a big upheaval. And uh, one of the concessions I had to make was as promising as the property was, no garage. Me, without a garage, that was a tough one. However, it turned out pretty good. I took on building the garage myself and uh, it was massive project. And of course I couldn't have an ordinary garage. I had to get into all kinds of uh, cool stuff. So um, we're gonna get back to more videos and some true blue nerd stuff and some cool science experiments and um yeah here i'll take you for a little tour oh you guys thought you were going to skip all the hard work not a chance i dug out the 150 foot perimeter trench for the footing and wall by hand three feet deep because i could because the property sits on completely natural construction grade sand any deeper than that is a hard pan of compressed sand and sediment so then I rented a small excavator to tackle the main feature, a 20 foot long pit, five feet deep. At that depth, a lot of water appears during rainy season, so we needed a dedicated sump pump and chamber. Next was to pump in the concrete for the pit floor and try my hand at floating concrete, which turned out just fine for a pit. Building the forms for the pit walls was the hardest part of the entire garage build. They are eight inches thick and contain conduits for electrical, plumbing, an evac fan setup, and built-in compressed air. There's a bathroom towards the back of the garage, which required another sump chamber and macerator pump to tie into the house sewage. But I'll finish it later and for now it can stay roughed in. The pit walls and entire concrete floor were pumpered in one shot. Well, you'll think well now. Now the form's all held and hanging up. It's always nice to know. <laughs> of course the form's all held. The form's all held. Now, you might spy this little 10 cubic foot beastie, which I built for smaller concrete projects, and it did contribute to the footings. But that is a story for another day. Trust me. Eli did a great job polishing. It looks wet, but it's not. Disassemble all the pit forms, clean it out, and promptly build cover plates so that no one falls in and breaks something. Now things get fun, faster, and easier. The 10 foot walls go up. It's an extra membrane. It's not needed. Throw some engineered trusses up there and sheet the roof. I had membraned the roof and added some roof trim, but I didn't like the window positioning. So I moved the windows down to line up with the top of the main garage door and added a small window above the side door. There, much better. See what I did there? Shingle the roof, loose skin, and in go the windows. Start on some insulation, heat up the panel, and get the electrical operational. That's Couton having a nap under a tree. Time for Tyvek, trim, doors, flashings, and it's on to hardy board siding. Add some exterior lights. Notice how the width between the garage and the fence is suspiciously the width of a long line of parts and project cars. Time to get anal about cedar siding and selecting shakes based on color and contrast. We are there. The exterior is done. Oh, wait. Add a retractable winch-based awning for some extra protection from the elements. Yes, that's what you thought it was. Just another project. Speaking of winch-based tools, let me introduce you to my mobile scaffold-based lift, which works very well to straddle cars and pits pictured here in a buddy's garage. Instead of a plank, it has a four by three inch square bar on which the winch can slide back and forth. And then a battery pack that can hang anywhere. It's time to get organized inside. The training jack goes to its new home. Although I more often than not drop the engine as opposed to just working on the training alone. I think I just look for excuses to drop the engine. It's great for slow-mo rides anyway. We're gonna need some stairs. And I rescued this flight from a BC ferry. I hope it didn't sink. It was about an inch too wide for the pit, but that was a good excuse to shake down my new plasma cutter with a six foot long cut. Stairs weigh many hundreds of pounds. 
And so it was another job for the lift system. I put the stairs on wheels so as to access the sump chamber underneath, practice my advanced parkour maneuvers and dance moves. I was actually testing the brakes because to keep the stairs from turning into the world's largest roller skate, I welded up a pivoting lever system for the front wheels so they only descend and operate when I need them to. I'm not done with those stairs yet. There's space there that can be utilized and I sense a project or two in the works. Let's step on down for a little 3D tour. The storage cubbies on either side are designed to nicely accommodate beer cans. I continued on with more infrastructure developments, which required a lot of time and effort. Lots of electrical, including four 220 volt outlets, four built-in compressed air outlets, insulation, drywall, Past the bathroom, we get into the back room, which is uh, an electronics workstation room. It's got mezzanine, wraparound mezzanine storage, and uh, I still have to finish the drywall underneath the shelving. It's all 12 volt LED lighting. And there's lots of built in uh, storage for bits and pieces. And the station itself is a complete disaster. And this, whoops, what is that? Spare 6G72. That won't always be there. Quick peek inside the bathroom, which is being used as storage. A few cool quirks. It's got a component stereo system. And uh, the tweeters are hidden up in the light and in the fan, which is a wheel that I split with a plasma cutter. Bright enough to land an aircraft and for seeing slivers. I scored a really great compressor. Formerly from a Kaiser Gym pneumatic resistance training system, it has dual compressor units, each with its own drying system, pulse with modulation valves, all controlled via a central computer that has dual digital pressure displays, and even an air diagnostics algorithm. Having that dry air would be great for sandblasting or paint and powder coat guns. It's also very quiet. The loudest thing actually about it is the PWM valves, which you'll hear in a few seconds. I also did add a copper uh, condenser setup, and you can also see that there's another pressure line that runs all the way up into the attic through that uh, little where the electrical conduits are. That supplies or feeds a huge, big uh, surge tank up in the attic. And uh, when you've got a retired electrician for a father-in-law, you uh, go all out and make the electrical panel look super fancy with some hardwood cupboards. And then you go even crazier and add some built-in 12-volt lighting. Oh, his face just lit right up. I also installed a big 12 volt battery uh, with a recharger that'll supply uh, emergency lighting, 12 volt emergency lighting, plus it'll also supply my winches, which I have doing various things like my retractable awning. I use every part of this garage right up to the 10 foot ceiling. Above the garage door, there's some extra storage there. And uh, I use the walls for some extra car parts. I mean, why not, right? And then you have to have a tire rack. And lots more storage. <laughs> you never have enough storage. Never, sorry, never have, what is it? Never have too much storage. Never have too much storage. You may have noticed I'm using two long strings of heavy duty temporary LED construction lighting, which I'm going to keep because it was handy to be able to reconfigure it as needed because I didn't know where I was going to be installing displaying stuff, where all the workspaces or storage would be, or how best to utilize it. And it could change, and it did. If I ever feel like making it permanent, I can recess a bunch of LED pot lights. I don't know about you, but I look for excuses to install stereos in just about everything. This is all old gear, um, and but it still sounds great. Several amps, and I even rescued my old 
stereo system from back in the day with the 10 disc changer and guess what the oversampling is on it four times oh yeah but hey it works of course it had to have some serious bass so I built a little fake skylight area and uh, that's all bass bin up there with some exposed beams ah uh, well you know <laughs> okay it's a little maybe it's a little bit much but now this oversized pot light looking thing is actually a recessed heavy-duty hook onto which that heavy scaffold winch lift bar of mine can hook onto and winch itself to the ceiling to store out of the way so I needed a locking mechanism for my main overhead door and what better way to do it than a Momo steering wheel rescued from a wrecker. It uses long sections of rebar going in either direction. It's got a nice little release locking setup. Gotta do it in style. You got rescued. So the plan for what's coming up and for the channel, there are a lot of tools I want to add still to this whole setup and uh, making tools is no exception. A few garage projects as well, but uh, ultimately it's uh, all about the car and I promised people that I would tell the story of how Gandalf became the first Mark 1 5S GTE in the world and so that'll be the focus for the next video and uh, but lots of developments for him everything from aerodynamic uh, to performance engine stuff and um, it's gonna be fun it's gonna be some true blue nerd stuff I promise okay that's it for now thanks for watching we'll see you soon I'm gonna go